So I'm now a professor from the uh, University of Utah, and I work for uh, Professor Hanwen at the moment. So yes, my talk will be about this uh, AU40, and uh, it's, uh, it's a cluster with a monolayer protection, a uh, left plane level mode. So here is the outline first introduction to what are the super and uh, And I will describe the current state properties of the AU for the experimental observations and, and theoretical predictions. And then I will uh, talk about optical properties and what kind of development work we need for G4 to see these results. And then we compare the experimental and uh, theoretical spectrum. So, what is a monolayer protected? Cluster. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple metal cluster, usually with some nice shape like a phygocytron or, or a prolate. And uh, uh, what is special in this, in this cluster is that it has actually a mole molecular, uh, molecular layer around the metallic core. And uh, well, we call them staples. So they kind of bind the metal core uh, together. And uh, then there is a uh, kind of organic layer outside of this, uh, these uh, staples, and this is all chemically bonded. So you have exact uh, uh, well defined geometry. That's very nice. So whenever you are doing experiments, you pretty much know that you have only this kind of well, if you purify your sample well and so on, you have, <laughs> you have this kind of cluster there and nothing else. Not Distribution plus. And possible applications for these kind of systems are, for example, bioignition, where the organic ignorance uh, give a possibility to make uh, some uh, site selective uh, or put some site selective ignorance there. The metallic core you can see in uh, them images, and uh, because these are only set, uh, you can see them also in the, in the uh, microscope. So there is an example, this is not actually one of these monolayer protected clusters, but it's, it's a, uh, called a nanorock, where you have some, <coughs> some non-technically bonded stuff around, but the, uh, the uh, basic idea is the same. And then there are a lot of other uh, applications, like chemical sensors and heavy metal scavenging. Uh, and now, this uh, other concept in the title is a sub super -weapon. So these superatoms are known quite a long time, so basically uh, these bare metal clusters, for example, sodium 9 plus is a superatom of eight electrons. So basically it's sodium like uh sodium like uh, oh, well there's no metal metal sodium is pretty noble. Anyway, so it's a sodium like uh, potential and then it's a spherical so you have uh, S2 B6. Occupation, so you basically have a full, full cell there. The problem with the, with the bare metal clusters is, of course, that they are very reactive and you have problems uh, uh, handling them. But for example, then this uh, AU25, this is like a basic example of this. Uh, it has the uh, protecting layer, which actually withdraws some electrons. So the core itself is uh, 30 electrons, but the ligands then suck some electrons out and then you have again this super atom but now it's protected and it's stable and you can actually do some experiments and store them for aging and this super uh, atom transistors then you can see in the in the spectra as a molecular kind of well defined piece in, in the uh, low energy region you have kind of homo to lumo transistors 25, but also you can uh, measure for this. Uh, uh, some of the some of the clusters are higher, so you can also uh, measure the uh, CT type circle, type of sigma, and uh, it has much more information. And as we will later see, this will be very important for this purpose. So. Uh, the experimentalists observed that uh, they have synthesized something which has a 
based on this uh, estimate images, one to two aspect ratio uh, from multi aspect, and they found out the composition is approximately of more or less well defined uh, 40 plus than 24. <laughs> it's because uh, they could uh, separate the chiral isomers, so they know that it's chiral, and then based on some uh, we can access reactions, they could see that there are two different kind of the kind of kinds of phase table to this one. And then uh Samingo did a lot of work and uh, he could figure out quite many different candidates for the for and this was all only cheap also. Uh, he could he tried first oplate and tetra before they know about the SME cheese. But uh, then he came up with this double like sahedral structure. So now it's basically this any file where you have to remove few plicans and then connect the things. But uh, actually the the plican structure is not exactly the same. But based on this uh, these experimental observations, he found out that okay maybe there is few of these long plicans and then a few of the shorter plicans. But the problem is that pretty much the energies are more or less the same. If you change the function on the change light bit, all these all these isomers are uh, kind of similar. So okay. Uh, so there's a problem. But anyway, it doesn't matter if uh, what what of those uh, isomers we take, we anyway see this superatom atom uh, behavior. And now it's a dye. So uh, there is a uh, density of states for both of the eigenzetras, upper and lower. And you see clearly that you have this P orbitals field, and then you uh, have uh, the same thing in the other one, and then on the LUMO you have the D orbitals. So it's at least based on theory, it looks like a uh, superatom. So then the optical property. <coughs> Well, if you look at the absorption spectra, there is really not much hope that you would actually uh, figure out what, what is the <coughs> isomer being predicted, which would match up. Oh, you cannot distinguish between the isomers. But circular dichroism actually shows pretty nice signal. And now the problem was that there was no CD in the in the tipo. Other uh, other clubs have, like Rubamol, ADF, but they are simply too slow. So I remember that all of us uh, are told me some uh, once that it took uh, ages to do just the first peak of this uh, 38. Um, so Michael Walter was kind enough to help us, and uh, he got this uh, CD implemented in. in uh, Few days, then I did some testing and debugging, and uh, it seemed to work pretty nice. We repeated some expert, uh, did some preference that. But what you have to do basically is just uh, take the casita linear response, calculate the response function from there, and you simply need to evaluate this huge uh, made uh, inner products, so the made magnetic inner products. And this you can get directly from the uh, from the angular moment operator or actually this uh, position uh, cross product between position and the uh, and the current. <coughs> but it was still a bit problem. Well, okay, sorry. <laughs> so uh, it actually works really nicely, and uh, this is a test case. Uh, of the AU38 and G4 gives, well, I would say excellent agreement with the experimental spectrum. So you get all the ups and downs, they are not exactly on the right intensity, but I would say that it's very good uh, agreement compared to the uh, sensitivity of the CD spectrum. But okay, <coughs> so that was not a good 40, but it was. 38. But anyway, it was a, now, because AU38 had a crystal structure, we could actually just take a crystal structure and cut with that CD, but, uh, but for uh, AU38 
before we didn't have the crystal structure, we just had the predictions. And uh, now we wanted to sample this, and there's also a problem that all these uh, staples have uh, options that there are, the ligands can be in a few different kind of chiral positions. So we had to do a lot of CD calculations, and uh, it would have taken just too much time. And, uh, so we decided that we will try to improve the uh, linear response of slightly. So the Mihal's whole implementation uh, did not already start, and this is because if you crash calculation from some strange reason, you just underestimate the wall time that you need, or if it's not converts, you have to start from the scratch. And we also have, well, not with this system, but other systems, we have the memory problem. So what we, or what I did there, uh, with help of Lucy and Kovara, is that I stored the uh, matrix uh, in index trace form. So instead of storing the matrix as a 2 by 2 array, I simply give the indices of the uh, excitations and store them as one line in the file. And this you can do, just append each index to, to the file without no problem. And uh, well, of course it uh, helps you with the memory because you don't have to actually have to store the whole matrix. You just store the well, one line basically uh, each time. And uh, then, well, this, this is kind of old idea, but the now uh, implemented it uh, so that it does it automatically. So it sorts all the transitions uh, by the sum energy differences. And we have found out that this, at least in these systems, works pretty nicely. So you just start calculating this uh, spectrum, and you see that it, as it goes on, it starts to converge. And when you decide that, okay, now I'm pretty sure that nothing changes anymore. You can cut the calculation and you don't waste anything anymore. And uh, also, this helps you to uh, when, when you're restarting. So actually, you just start, start acting the indices in the, in the end of the file. all this together it's pretty nice because then you can restart, you can continue, you can do pretty much everything easily and uh, if something crashes there is nothing really lost. Okay, this is the slide from my previous talk. So now we can do this pretty much uh, with the, well as you said like 100,000 cores. Usually we now run on 8,000 cores. This and, uh, so some part of the uh, Parallelization comes from the uh, domain composition and rest comes from the uh, electron hole parallelization where you actually split the matrix row by row and distribute these to the uh, between the processors and it is just trivial so you can scale up as long as you have the rows in the matrix. Okay, so let's use this now for something new. Ah, okay, well, the absorption spectrum, yes, so there is nothing much to say. All could be agreement or not. Well, maybe you can rule out one of those. <coughs> but the CD, well, it was, this is actually from the article of this figure, and it was pretty good. So the A1 has a pretty nice agreement uh, in the high energy. Reason. And the B1 has a pretty nice agreement in the low energy reason. But it was not perfect, but it was kind of enough to convince the referees that it's that, uh, <laughs> most likely something like this, if it's not exactly this. And then submitted a few more calculations meanwhile, and it found that pretty much the exact uh, match. So I think this is uh, as good as you can get with the. Uh, so, uh, each of those ups and downs is, uh, is there. Also, if it's double peak or uh, the broadening is not homogeneous, you see something that uh, it's, it's a pretty good match. And 
uh, here is the actual structure. So uh, now that I was talking about the first layer. So what gives the absolute structure see? So uh, these angles. So it can be from this direction or from this direction. And same thing here. And here and here and here. So there are pretty many options, but you have to scan to find out this. If you were somewhat lucky, we didn't scan, of course, all of them. But we, it just guessed that, okay, it must be this place in geometry called. So, summary. So, AU30 uh, AU is a, a superatom of two eight electron superatom. Uh, it's a dimer of uh, two uh, eight electron superatoms. And uh, we see here this uh, index uh, in air response code. We use scale up to very large calculation scan quite many different uh, structures. We saw that the CD is very strict uh, uh, test for these structures. So basically, we can say that this is the structure, absolute structure, what should be seen in the, in the X-ray uh, from the crystal structure. Okay, here are the acknowledgements. So I work for one mark here. And so we will not all estimate uh, most of these, these calculations. <coughs> and you see the one help with the code. We now work the, the initial version of the CD. And then uh, these people are the experimental collaborators in the paper. Thank you. <coughs>
but these are converged. So, so these are converged with, with uh, terms of unoccupied states, because these are exhortations. Yes, they below energy, right? So we pretty much yeah. can say that, okay, when we take energy, uh, or some energy differences, uh, let's, let's say five, we can say that energy are, uh, transitions are converged up to four, four and a half degrees. In this case, at least. I, I, I know that it's not always the case, but in, in these systems it works pretty well. I'm surprised how well it works. Yeah. Somebody yeah. mentioned the word back-end access to me, and I had no idea what it was. But somehow, if that calculation crashes and you have distributed over many, many, many cores, don't you need to get the files or the temporary swap files or something like that? Temporary swap. There are no step temporary swap. There are no. Okay. So this. Somewhere this information was be stored. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it's a, whenever you calculate a row, you store it immediately. You just append it to the end of the file. So simple, it's nothing special. So you maybe lose this one row. I am sure. So that's all what you can do. So there is no other I would ask. Uh, I, I don't understand how you do this. Uh, I mean, you have this AI with DJ. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so if, you, if you distribute them over the CPUs, you, yeah. you always have the combination of everything, basically. How, how do you do that? So, so if that A, A, say, uh, AI is on one CPU and EJ is on the other, but they still have, you have to calculate this, this matrix. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the, all the main functions are on all, uh, all uh, processes. But what you calculate, you calculate one row. On ah, okay. Yeah. But you store it still every single. The main functions are on the okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, now all yeah. the details are. Just could you say a little bit about when you calculate the circular algorithm mm -hmm. uh, spectra, what, what that is? And, and why would you like to use the circular algorithm compared to just an absorption standard absorption mm -hmm. spectrum? Well, yeah, okay. <coughs> That's a very good <laughs> Or I should have said, but this, this uh, so but these two slides basically tell why we want to use uh, circular diagrams. So there's pretty much no features in the absorption spectrum, but in the circular diagram spectrum, you have a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, different features. Uh, circular diagram is uh, when you shine light, polarized light on uh, molecule. It, uh, if it's chiral molecule, it turns the light uh, differently to different directions. So this is the difference. What, what you show that. So if you shine light on, on uh, 500, it turns to 100 direction, it, then you turn, uh, shine light on uh, 400, it turns to 100 direction. And this is very sensitive to the, uh, to this uh, higher component, the absolute orientation. Okay. Well, the, there are no other questions. We thank Laurie and